Uh, so, um, good evening. Uh, we, I'm pretty excited about hosting this panel with some extremely learned, uh, varied viewpoints in the panel. And I think it should be interesting for you, hopefully keep you awake this time in the evening. Uh, it's an important issue, and I think it's an important and uh, timely issue at this point in time, uh, talking about uh, norms on preserving financial stability for a couple of reasons. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of action we have seen in India in terms of how we are looking at uh, financial institutions from a stability standpoint. Uh, it's an interesting thing I say, I've repeated it a couple of times now, but what we probably did in 14 months after demonetization hasn't probably happened in India for the last 14 years. So I think we're at a standpoint where there is clearly a base to be able to leverage, to build on from. Uh, there is an intent and an ambition within the industry and the, <clears throat> and the government to create a digital India which actually works. And what I'm going to do for starting off the panel is literally opening remarks across to my fellow panelists, five, two or three minutes on what, <clears throat> what are some of their high-level views on what really it means in terms of financial stability and what, is <clears throat> what are some of the policy levers we can follow as we move this forward. Sorry. Mamta, can we start with you, please? Oh, okay, sorry. So, um, my, this thing is more going to be more around uh, what are the fundamental issues that I see from my experience of working in the field in financial inclusion or financial systems and how we can really make it work better. <coughs> uh, financial inclusion is definitely not just opening bank accounts. We have sort of, like Rohan said, especially post demonetization, really have large number of bank accounts, but a very high rate of dormancy, about 48% dormancy. So that really does not uh, qualify as bank, <clears throat> as financial inclusion. It is access to credit, access to other financial service, timely and for the base of the pyramid, who we really want to reach out to. So some of the things that we've seen um, and which a system response needs to be in place is about simple things like awareness. People are not aware of how a system, <coughs> your financial systems work, what are their rights, <clears throat> what, what are they entitled for, and how, do, how can they actually raise their grievances? The, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, this seems to be some kind of <coughs> <coughs> contagious. I know, khas khas ke. Badi badi baat ho, fir hum khas te rehte hain. See, it's got on. Anyway. This is also a problem of Delhi, just sort of beginning, uh, and of closed rooms. Um, so yeah, so one is this entire issue of what is the uh, availability of banking networks and how open and amenable are the banking networks to service the very poor. Given the kind of pressure, especially in India, the kind of uh, challenges that they've been facing on their main lending. So that's one big part of how the network, how the banking services as a whole, uh, as a whole respond. Uh, the other is, uh, as I said, is a lack of knowledge, lack of awareness. And in our work, we've seen that this entire combination of financial, digital transaction literacy combined with women's empowerment actually has improved not household dynamics and improved uh, more responsible <coughs> financial behavior. So that's, again, we see as um, one big gap. The other is the access to all these financial services, digital, this thing, is, is really, really influenced by very, um, very hard, uh, I wouldn't say hard to shift, but norms, you know, especially for women, whether their access to mobile phones, their access to the use of mobile phones, their access to technology, very, very limited, and especially for younger people. So how do you, how do you incentivize <clears throat> and create 
create a more enabling environment that takes away this uh, idea that if a woman or if a young girl is using a mobile phone, she may just get polluted or she may be going to all kinds of sites. And this is a very real issue. Women's access to mobile phones, we want them to do financial transactions, is very, very limited. <clears throat> There's also, um, while our smartphone penetration and interne internet is going to be the next revolution that defines and how India leapfrogs several uh, <clears throat> steps of economic growth, at right now, the digital divide, the gender divide, is fairly high. Uh, only one third of women are on uh, on internet. I mean, given the overall this thing, um, I think, and I'm sure my other panelists are better equipped to talk about regulations. But seriously, regulations about data security, data protection, the confidence that if I do this transaction, what does it really mean? The interoperability, interoperab again, a big, big challenge, especially if you want to make the whole thing very accessible, very enabling at the field level. Uh, you don't really expect different banks to have their uh, uh, you know, service points. Um, it just defeats the purpose. The entire requirement for paperwork, I mean, I was in the field, uh, yes, the, a couple of days back, and uh, you know, requirements from SAG that the banks that gives them, I mean, it's a fairly complicated, needless. Pointless. It doesn't help when you already have a strong KYC system uh, in place. And finally, grievances, grievance redressal, again, um, a very weak area. And I think finally, uh, like I said, the banking service uh, to respond, but also the, uh, we, need, uh, we need very capable bureaucracy also. You can, we can bring in very nice, very good uh, rules and programs and uh, schemes, but the implementation uh, remains the challenge. But it's not to say that the picture is very grim, it's very positive. I mean, digital financial uh, access has <coughs> is actually empowering people, making them, uh, there's a lot of feel good factor about it. You feel good, you feel smart, you feel you're able to transfer money. It has actually helped a lot of migrating population for transactions of money and also connected, kept, keep, kept the people connected. And I've seen it, uh, you know, it's taken a lot of social pain away from being away from the family. So that's my initial uh, comments. Maybe we'll come back. I'm not sure if this is what. Yeah, you can do this. Good evening, everyone. My name is Abhinav, uh, and I run a company called uh, Echo. Um, in India, the big macro that ECHO is chasing is uh, in India, close to about 90% of working Indians continue to earn in cash. This is 2018 and still 90% of working Indians continue to earn, earn in cash. And uh, for all the popular you know, mobile uh, banking applications, wallets, UPI, all the really good stuff that we, you and I and everybody in this, in this room uses in India, there is one basic premise behind all those solutions, that as a consumer, I'm earning my wages, my salary electronically. But the reality in India is that 90% of Indian, working Indians continue to earn in cash. And that's where my organization works. We convert people who are earning cash, we give them ways to convert the cash into digital. And once the money is converted into digital, that's when the transactions start. And to make this happen, we uh, Echo has partnered with close to about 100,000 uh, retail points across the country where consumers earning in cash can walk into these stores, convert their cash into digital. And once the money is digital, they, they can then start to use those, uh, you know, that digital money in, in various forms. Uh, my company is about uh, 11 years old. And, uh, you know, we were, uh, when we started, uh, when I started Echo in 2007, there wasn't uh, any regulation around uh, um, financial services being accessible to common, common citizens in this country at a retail point. And uh, at that point in time, the banking infrastructure, let's say the bank branches or even the ATMs, were probably 120th or like 130th of what it should be in terms of the infrastructure available. Uh, the in infrastructure availability that India should have had. And uh, we, were, we were really the first set of entrepreneurs trying to push the regulations when we said that consumers need not walk into bank branches or ATMs, but could walk into the closest mom and pop stores and get the basic financial services uh, uh, available. My personal journey is about 11 years in this. We have uh, catered to close to about 50 million customers in the last 11 years. And uh, despite the 50 million number, which could be probably population for a few, few uh, countries, 
in our in our space we consider we've not even probably touched the tip of the iceberg and we continue to continue to do this grow and uh, something that you know rohan pointed out post demonetization i'm sure post demonetization there's been fantastic growth in digital payments i would love to share that there's fantastic growth in uh, people walking into my stores and converting cash into digital so the reality is that you know i and people like us sitting in this room are swiping our cards more we are using all really really good technology upi stuff to do digital transactions and so are people who are earning in earning in cash and and they are not the poor 90% of india is not poor so people who earn anything between let's say 10000 indian rupees per month to all the way to 50 60000 indian rupees per month earning in cash and doing these transactions and interestingly the reason why it is it is like this is that most of the jobs in india are very contractual you know they are subcontracted multiple layers of subcontracting happens and as a result of which the wages salaries whether dispersed on a daily basis 15 day basis monthly basis whatever it is gets dispersed in cash and that's where uh, echo and and uh, you know my my peer peer set of companies are working to enable this set of uh, these set of transactions uh, you know as the uh, panel uh, goes forward we can definitely i can definitely share my personal experiences when we've you know what we've done uh, over the last 11 years to spread awareness of people get, getting comfortable walking into a kirana store or a grocery store and doing a financial or a banking transaction access regulation everything has been in the right direction in this country uh, as an entrepreneur i would complain that probably the speech could have been better but uh, needless to say that it, it's true almost almost everywhere in any sector but uh, you know security in financial services especially for the customer segment that we cater to is very very important very hard earned money and uh, you know happy to share more uh, once the introductory round is over thanks okay. thank you um i'm going to just create a, a disruption from the beginning because i'm going to show you the angle of countries like ours which is cameroon in west africa where the discussion is just starting and i will give a simple example um, of something that i lived through as the ceo of eco bank in cameroon where um, two years ago or actually last year i launched the mobile app for clients and immediately we did that and i went around with a campaign of saying we are going digital do your payments you know check your account balances using the mobile app i actually had a run on the bank i lost um, almost 30 million dollars in two days of people coming to withdraw their deposits thinking that going digital means um, the bank is closing so i'm bringing the aspect that while we are talking about securing digital payments in some economies you still have some like ours in central africa where anything digital is scary first of all it's a culture shock people want to move around with $40,000 to go and purchase something people want to go and queue up in the bank just to withdraw um $100 even though they have an atm card in their pocket and to give you the perspective if you look at um cameroon we are 25 million of us and the telco companies that just came um 15 years ago have 16 million customers and they have been able to identify um each person to a sim card we are 15 banks and we have just 2.5 million customers so you have a telco four telco companies that have 16 million mobile users and you have 15 banks commercial banks that only have 2.5 million so therefore financial inclusion is a problem and you would think that um when you come with the proposition that let's go digital so that everybody can have access to a simple bank account people who don't have a bank account can have um an online account just to transact just to receive money um but most of the population would prefer to deal with the telcos where with his mobile phone he can receive mobile money so that is one aspect you have the population that has to go through the culture shock and accept that digital means ease of living for them you have the governments 
who is grappling with the regulators to try to block any digital movement because of fear. They look at not having the control. Um, maybe there will be money laundering. Maybe the terrorists will be able to transmit funds easier, and they want to block or, I would say, hold the reins on how fast the banks and the telcos can go. And then you have the banks and the other financial institutions, like ECHO, that want to provide a solution to the population, want to participate in economic development. Of course, we all want to earn revenue and commissions. But this is something that is necessary for us to be able to move forward and grow the economies. But it is critical that the government and the private sector come together to develop and promote norms to secure the financial um, infrastructure. Because at the end of the day, we're talking about people's money. We're talking about hard-earned savings. We're talking about improving the remittance platforms because most of our economies um, depend on remittances that are coming in to build our foreign currency reserves. So there are a lot of things at stake. Um, and it's critical for both parties, both public and private sector, to come together to secure it and make it a reality. So I will start with that and then wait for the conversation to go further. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. The cough's better. Uh, so let me just go back sequen. Sure. No, no, yeah. I just wanted to uh, completely agree with you uh, when it's about the culture shock. Uh, even now, we see a lot of culture shock when we're talking about digital payments. Especially when the money or that proves that we're missing and the confidence of not seeing it, belonging in it. It's a, it's a, it's a big deal. We are also facing the need to live on a digital currency. Right. No, great. I think, and to that point, Mamta, let me let me start again with uh, more targeted individual questions for each of you. Uh, but I, I think it's interesting the observations you made. And here's here's the funny story, right? And the funny story is that uh, <clears throat> today, when you look at India, we have like a three or four percent digital PCE, right? Our personal consumption of expenditures about that much, which simple English means ninety five percent still cash. Now. If you really break down even that 5%, you will see 90% of that 5% of our digital PC is people like you and me going to the ATM and withdrawing cash. So that's, that's a very fundamental issue. We talk about a digital India, we talk about moving to a digital economy, but at the heart of it, it's a very soft issue. It's a consumer behavior issue. So in your experience, and you alluded to a term which I'm very fond of personally called interoperability. Uh, uh, ambitious, we're trying to do that, I don't think we're still there. What do you think are some of the policy levers that should be pulled at this time because it's ironical when, you know, when I, mean, I was talking about the infrastructure, we've grown for about, from about 1.5 odd million post terminals to what, 3 million? 3 million, right? But the question nobody asks is, India still has the lowest usage. So it's one thing to create infrastructure, it's another thing to use that infrastructure. What do you think are some of the last mile solves? Because also in the last mile, if you see, today probably the poorest people pay the most, right? If you look at a USSD transaction, that's a 50 paisa transaction into five, that's two and a half rupees for the poorest person to transact digitally. So are there learnings, experiences that you've seen from the field which could help us or educate us and educate people like Abhinav and across to be able to do much more for the last mile? And this is, op this is honestly to the both of you. So I, I think it's, it's that question to solve for. Uh, Rohan, thanks for asking that question. I had just have a very, very small anecdote to share here. Uh, on the 8th of November, when the Prime Minister announced demonetization, I actually thought this was going to be a the fantastic moment for my organization. I really thought so. Because we are a regulated entity, and the, uh, the circular that came in, came out the next morning for us was that people, citizens in this country, are expected to go to bank branches and convert their cash to the new currencies. And we thought because we are, we are a regulated entity by Reserve Bank of India, the government would allow consumers to come even to our retail outlets and convert, you know, can at least deposit the money. And uh, so that was the expectation for organizations like ours, you know, where we were, you know, literally providing, uh, you know, what do I say, maybe tellers on the cloud or, or like small extension bank counters. And we thought that, you know, this is absolutely the best thing that could happen to, to, to Echo. 
but uh, the, the good news kind of finished by about 10 in the morning the next day. You know, when we were told that you guys are not participating, it is only the bank branches. Yeah. And uh, so wherever we were, you know, in terms of our business volumes, for the next two months, we did half the business. So it was unlike the digital wallet space where the transactions went through the roof, we actually went half. Because consumers, you know, we, they, they just didn't have, this, have, have cash. And the stories that we picked up was that uh, either the wages were not being dispersed or older currencies were kind of disbursed for six months and therefore people had to stand in the queues and whatever it was. But interestingly, because our business went half, we said, what do we do? You know, everything, everything in the digital space is going through the roof and, you know, we're not doing enough business. We were concerned about, you know, whether we're going to, you know, go shut us down. I don't know what we were thinking, but, you know, we came out with this product, you know, where people with debit cards could come to a retailer and do a transaction. It was not really a payment acceptance transaction. So they were not paying for goods at the retail outlet. But it was a transaction where you could swipe your debit card to remit money back home. And we thought, while we launched this product, we thought that no one's going to use it. Because we assumed, sitting in our offices, that people who have debit cards can do the remittance to their families back home themselves. But to our surprise, you know, it was absolutely a product coming out of desperate needs to do something during demonetization. But to our surprise, it was the product that did, that did significantly well for the first six months, and it's, it's been growing since then for, for us. And you're absolutely right. You know, there is, I think, uh, if, I'm, if my numbers are not wrong, in India, the withdrawal, we withdraw close to about a billion dollars every day. And uh, so, so people who are who are earning electronically, we have bank accounts, we know how to use debit cards, we, we remember our PIN numbers, we know how to use an ATM, we go and withdraw money. And what was interesting is that, you know, so, so people, you know, we were assuming that people who are technology savvy, have bank accounts, have smartphones, etc., would not do cash transactions. But that was, despite running this organization for 10 years, it was a learning that we had during uh, the period of demonetization. And, uh, Absolutely, it is. It is a matter of uh, you know very cultural thing that uh, you know cash is what cash is in our country. I think uh, I think uh, it's it's going to be a slow process, and I think uh, as far as uh, the industry players are concerned, I think as far as Reserve Bank of India is concerned, I think we are doing the right things. At least uh, you know at least we are talking of the right things, and I'm sure you know uh, interoperability and stuff like that is only going to come in with the right levels of security in the transactions for people to adopt more. So, so while, I, while I sit here and say that, you know, 90% of Indians are earning in cash and 95% of our transactions are happening in cash, but the reality also is this number is going down. This number is not going down to the rate at which probably everybody sitting in this room would want it, but it is going down. And I think that's the good news. I think it's a matter of how fast the organ, the regulators, the policy, the industry players can kind of push that and see you know, how fast we can get to better levels of digital payments. So, uh, yeah, so I've seen a lot of remittances that people are doing um, from people who are earning in cash and are sending money back to their villages in cash. And that's, so that kind of transaction uh, is very encouraging. It's beginning to happen uh, a lot of uh, a lot more. So in our in our I mean we run a program on uh, financial uh, digital inclusion, working through this uh, microfinance institutions and using self help group networks. Um, so one of the things that's really worked is making people more familiar with the entire technology, making people more familiar with the benefits of it. So it's it's, it's a bit of a slow process, but once. <laughs> Uh, a critical uh, sort of <coughs> mass is achieved, it, it triggers quite well. Uh, what has also worked is uh, sort of doorstep services. Going to the bank branch and getting, I mean, dealing with all this is not viable, it's not functional, it takes a lot of time. Uh, and like I said, banks really don't have that kind of bandwidth of preference or the patience or the uh, this thing to deal with people with dignity. So, I mean, something that we've tried and that sort of worked, and we're not the only ones, a lot of people have tried, is this entire concept of uh, banking correspondent bank suckies, but making them more sort of capable and so that they can provide all kinds of financial services at a, at a village cluster level. So not just to the group members, but others. So that, again, gives a lot of confidence because it's a woman from the community 
uh, part of their membership who is able to do this with confidence. So that really, really, and they're doing transactions like, um, uh, I mean, in Bihar from one district, uh, it was something around one crore. Uh, so it's pretty impressive. So they're able to do those kind of transactions. So I think the more we do it, the better it is. And the banks and the regulatory uh, framework um, needs to really, really look at uh, look at it from the consumer point of view. Right now, it's only been uh, supply driven, but nobody has looked at um, how is the consumer, their confidence level, what do they feel about it. So in one of the studies we did, it was like only 20% of the people were even comfortable talking about it or using or, uh, you know, this thing. So 77% had the, had the ATM card, but only about 30, 35% were actually using it to make those kind of, so it, all that, um, I think uh, really needs to be put in place. And I think solutions are still missing. So suddenly, I mean, we were trying to say, okay, what is it that, uh, what is it that we should promote? What kind of solution? But there's so many different apps, so many different wallets with so many different, uh, you know, pin numbers and uh, uh, access issues. So, and again, of course, the fundamental is that we also don't have uh, internet penetration and the networks all over. So there's a combination of things, uh, but I think the more we build a better awareness, better knowledge, more comfortable, it'll become better. And my favorite is that access to phone is so limited, incentivized, big special products around getting women access to a mobile phone, a smartphone. Uh, make it cheaper, make it more available. <laughs> I'll slip into that. <laughs> but uh, I, I think it's a very important point that you make, Mamta, because you know something that we forget in India is that even though the government enshrined this whole thing on jam, right? Chandhan, Aadhaar, Mobile. But what we need to realize in a country of 1.2 billion is that, yes, there are 300 million smartphones, there are 300 million feature phones, and there are 300 million no phones, right? So in case financial inclusion literally needs to move to inclusive growth, which it should. I think uh, solution customization is at the heart of that. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna spin to Gwendolyn because I think she made a couple of interesting points. Uh, to me, hearing and sitting and understanding all of these things, one of the important tenets is trust, right? And I think trust is an extremely important uh, measure of how progressively a country can move towards financial inclusion, inclusive growth, and actually see benefit from all of that. Uh, in your example, uh, and in your experience, uh, are there certain trust-building measures that you have undertaken? And I talk purely from a standpoint of us hearing about the M-Pesas and the Sasas in South Africa and Kenya, etc., which have been great precedents to India, except, you know, we have the scale, and scale imposes certain different challenges. Uh, as learnings from Africa to India, and I think that's a very important part because you did start that journey much before. What would be some high level, some high level policy measures or some high level trust building exercises that you think are important as we undertake this journey towards a digital India? And I think there's a lot to learn from the subcontinent of Africa because there is an amalgamated, integrated approach that worked. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are still trying to make it work. And it uh, would be very useful for the panel to be able to understand you know, what you think could be those measures which we could look at, which we probably might not have looked at as we have moved towards universal financial inclusion as an ambition in India by 2022. Okay. okay. I think um, the Impesa story, it's um, a success story that we should all share. And it's because you had the government and the private sector coming together to change the culture and do it together. So that built trust. The issue is with us, we adapted that. So we had the telcos who started doing mobile money transactions. So um, it involved the population from the little to the big by identifying and having them involved in that basic payment transfer of money through mobile money. And people felt comfortable with that because it was, it was embraced by both the government and the private sector. So it made it legitimate. We know that this is true, it exists, and we understand it's going from this number 
to this number and I can pick it up. The problem is when you want to migrate to digital payments, telling people you can use the QR code, um, scan and pay from your phone, you can use the, um, the ATM cards. When the person is not comfortable to use it from an ATM machine, now you tell him to go to a supermarket and put his card in and you know all of that, and you tell them you can go online on your retail internet banking and transfer money from your account to another account, the person cannot grasp it. And you, they see the regulator stepping in to give, I'll give an, a practical example. The telcos got approval from the central bank to do money transfer between um, Cameroon and the other CEMAC countries because one of the specifics I would like to point out is that the Central African countries have the same central bank. So all six of us, Cameroon, Gabon, Congo, Brazzaville, Chad, Equatorial Guinea, we all share the same central bank. So we all have the same currency. So transferring money from Cameroon to Gabon is not uh, an international transfer because it's just the same currency. Okay, so the telcos got approval for the mobile money to extend beyond the borders. They did that, a lot of campaign advertisement, and after two weeks, the governor said, no, I don't want that anymore, stop. You can imagine the effect it had on the population. It shows that there's something that is wrong here. Let me be afraid and let me no longer use this digital payment tool. So the regulators have to come in and work with the private sector for us to agree on what is the agenda. Because if the government validates and the private sector implements, it builds trust. And when there's trust, people would adhere and be able to change, do that culture shift that is okay to transfer through a written application in the bank, but it's also okay for me to transfer money on my phone. It's okay for me to go to the agent on the street and transfer money because the government, which is a central body for most of these economies, which people look up to to give the right signal, has given the approval and the private sector is implementing. But what most governments, and I'll give the example when you're talking about data localization, our central bank is already giving a regulation to say, we don't want banks to have their servers out of the country. If EcoBank is operating in Cameroon, then all of its servers should be sitting in Cameroon. In this world today, it's not possible because I have servers in Cameroon, but I have servers in Ghana. I have servers in Nigeria, I have servers in New York, and that is how it's going to be. My email and my data is going on cloud, and they are making regulations to say, we don't want cloud um, computing. But you haven't made the basic regulation for me to transfer money. So why are you bothering yourself about data localization when we have not yet collected data? The Cameroon government doesn't have a unique identifier. So instead of being focused on the basic, which is to help to change the culture shift, to help to build a secure infrastructure that people can do basic transfers, you are already putting a block on data localization, on cloud computing, when you haven't done the basics of building an infrastructure that works. So I think there needs to be that collaboration for us to first develop you know, a, a unique identifier to develop where we can locate people, to build that trust in our population that the digital payments or services is where we have to go because we all have to be in a financial inclusive environment. We have to ease, change the way of our lives because you don't need to leave your village and travel six hours to the nearest bank to make a school fee payment. You don't need to call your sister in the city to collect money that your sister in the US has sent. You should be able to sit where you are, anywhere you are, and participate in the financial economy. So I think, um, we all have to work together to build the capacity. We have to work together to build that security and stability so that financial inclusion will not just be a fancy term, but will actually become a reality that our economies will evolve in. Uh, thanks, no, absolutely. You raised a couple of uh, hot potatoes in that. Uh, we'll come to those later in terms of localization and uh, 
<clears throat> unique identifier. But uh, let me go back to Abhinav, maybe. Just, uh, I, I think it's an important uh, point in the last mile story, right? Uh, our last mile story presently looks, uh, looks fairly blurry, if you look at it, in terms of what's happened in India. But uh, Abhinav, having represented or looked at the important banking correspondent network, which I think is an important backbone of what we try to do last mile in onboarding, especially. Uh, it's a very interesting term I heard like a couple of months back was that onboarding should be fidgetal. I understand portmanteau words, but uh, a mix of fidget, physical and digital is probably what would make it work for India in the way we want to make it work. Because presently, I think an either or approach doesn't really work. Uh, from your experience, obviously, having been in the field, worked with banks, etc., uh, do you think there is a possibility for us to reimagine the scope and the scale and the way that the banking correspondent network today is empowered to do what they do, and could they be empowered to do much more? Because I think that last mile connect, which hinges extensively on trust, relationship, etc., especially in an Indian uh, context, is important. So is that something that you've put thoughts to and could let us know what that could look like because I think the government's receptive uh, to look at that. I don't know except uh, how that's going to be done. Uh, thanks for uh, asking a very tough question. <laughs> uh, first, uh, you know, just for people who are not aware of, business correspondents are, uh, you know, in layman term, it, these are uh, outsourced bank branches. So single person outsourced bank branches. So uh, typical, you know, the way my business works. So if a Kirana store works for a bank, it's a business correspondent. Now, in my 11 years, uh, we've got to 100,000 retail points. Now, if you ask me from a from a India scale perspective, I don't think so. it's a great job done. Uh, 100,000 is really nothing, you know, you know, you know, you just mentioned that 300 million people don't have probably have feature phones and 300 million people don't have phones. So probably those 600 million people are for sure not doing digital transactions. And uh, in order to get to these 600 million people, I don't think so 100,000 by echo or the entire my peer group would let's say have a million. Now even if you are at a million, which is probably a stretch, uh, I, don't think so. I don't think so the industry is where India needs it to be. And uh, you know, so in order to service uh, you know a base like 600 million people and and get them to do basic uh, bank account opening stuff and then then provide them you know deposit you know availability of of uh, making a deposit transaction, doing a withdrawal transaction, and thereafter digital transactions. I think the you know the probably the number of retail points and all of this needs to be probably closer to 10 million kind of numbers for us to get to. And uh, in, in, in our journey, and honestly, you know, uh, I'm, a, I'm a first generation entrepreneur. We started this company out of our credit cards and debit cards to fund ourselves. And uh, only to realize that the further we went inside and deeper in the country, the way it was just way difficult to do business. You know, because the cost of making people aware that this is a service is very difficult. So, so acquisition of that retailer is difficult. The acquisition of the customer is difficult. The acquisition, the training is difficult. The awareness is difficult. All sorts of things are very difficult. And this was very difficult in 2007. I think those things are much easier in 2018. And this is thanks to, you know, for instance, even at the customer level that we cater to, there are fantastic, you know, there are 300 million people who do not have uh, smartphones and 300 million people who don't have Phones, but there are 300 million people who have smartphones, and we are adding close to about 10 million uh, smartphones a month. The data is very, very cheap these days. And what's happening is that 50, you know, about five years back, 100% of customers who would come to Echo, you know, would would be carrying a feature phone. But today, close to about in urban centers, in centers like Delhi and Bombay, close to about 70% of customers who walk into stores, services who consume services of Echo come with a smartphone. And so at least that's the encouraging point, you know. So therefore, the, the, the ability for us to train, to make people aware, to, to get a lot of things done, which was super difficult in 2007 and much easier in 2018. And uh, I, would, I would, again, reiterate uh, Mamta's point that, you know, some of these basic infrastructure, unless and until this goes tenfold, it was almost impossible to push digital payments beyond a point. And, uh, and uh, you know, it just—I can't just 
keep on reiterating the importance of you know getting the really good i won't say bad quality smartphones out there but good smartphones out there over a period of time get uh, you know we 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 say say that data is cheap but honestly in india the data quality is horrible you know we we talk about that we are the cheapest in data but honestly you know you just go out to a much smaller economy in a much smaller country and you'll find that the data speeds are much better i don't i wonder why correct and uh, so the data has got to get better the phones have got to get better and and at least my experience is that the growth that hap- has happened in organization like ours or in general the the business correspondent uh, space i think if we this next 10 years is going to be going to be 50x of the last 10 years and uh, and what's what's very encouraging is that uh, you know people who walk into our stores and retail outlets and things like that they are consuming apps like everyone's got facebook almost everyone's got whatsapp everyone's got got apps like share chat um, i i don't know whether how many of us use share chat but, but you got to check share chat out i'm sure uh, you would be aware of what share chat is <laughs> and uh, oh my goodness and these are you know, look at those solutions and you'll um, you'll be amazed the content on some of those platforms are far more advanced and far more better than the contents that we consume even to the likes of hotstar and netflix and stuff like that and uh, that is where uh, you know at least when, when when we are thinking about our business of taking financial services in the infrastructure forward in this country i think the bright spot is that people have started to use facebook if people have started to use facebook if people have started to use whatsapp we will get there i think that's where that's how we kind of look at Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, biting in again. Uh, so we're also doing. You know, India has this large livelihood mission programs that that work uh, that reach the deepest pockets of uh, and work largely with women. So they've also tried an experiment. Everybody recognizes the need to do this. Uh, so there are two or three points I wanted to make. They may not be all related. um uh, sorry connected uh, they are related to the topic uh is that they tried to work with different like they tried the mpesa model they tried the uh, you know uh, airtel mobile or whatever mobile payments and so on but somewhere or the other there was a systemic failure that did not allow them to sort of go to scale which i think increasingly people are recognizing and trying to uh, work around um again i come back to the point of how the overall enabling environment in terms of bringing people's confidence financial literacy digital literacy and transaction literacy three things together are really important in people and really when we talk about financial inclusion very often we just limit it to this credit moving of saving and so on unless we don't link it with larger things that people can actually do meaningfully access to larger credit Uh, access to finance more meaningfully i think uh, and their ability to access all the entitlements and services so i don't the dbt and all i don't know how effective one thing that you know you did ask me whether the the business correspondent community can be can be leveraged to do a lot more and i i'll i'll, I'll share just two examples uh, mostly in the last 12 months one is that some of at least on the insurance side some some very very fantastic products get sold over my platform and i often tend to look at the some of those products and say why the hell am i not buying from my own platform mm. because uh, you know these guys uh, these insurance would 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 sell uh, health insurance for 500 bucks it is it is as good as whatever i have bought for myself and that what encourages that you know today even sachet financial products we were talking about it about 5 years back but today it is happening which is fantastic the other thing which i'm very happy to share here in this forum is that today over echo's platform and and i'm talking about echo echo but there are multiple platforms like ours where some of these things are happening where even daily credits daily credit products are being rolled out so if i need extra money today and i'm ready to give back the money tomorrow morning there are lenders who are coming out with products like that and that's very 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 encouraging that you know people today have realized that you know at least wherever some of these platforms have managed to get to there are uh, providers who are thinking about consumers and products that can very very nicely fit into some of these infrastructures and i don't think so there are huge numbers around it at this point in time but, but yeah but but so but just about to happen that the future of the i mean the volume is going to come from microtransactions 
exactly like what you're describing. Oh, it's where your technology of block. Um, let me again throw a, a curveball in this discussion. While um, in India, for example, you're already at the stage where agency banking, what you're describing, is already in force. In Cameroon where, um, and in Central Africa, where we are saying um, the telcos are already doing mobile money, the banks are in the, the same space. Let us expand, because as a bank, you're trying to reduce the brick, brick and mortar banking of those days where I have to have a branch everywhere in, in Cameroon to saying I would have main branches and I can work through um, an agent to give the service like what you have here. Um, the regulators come in again, you know, when they see that it's being deployed very quickly to say stop. If you want to use a third party to link or do bank services for you, it has to be somebody who has a financial institution license, which then limits the whole purpose of development. Because if you're only going to work with banks or microfinances, you are still not going to achieve the level of financial inclusion that you need. The whole ecosystem, um, what we're talking about interoperability, is to make sure that if we can all link our infrastructures, it creates trust and um, um, a, a resilient infrastructure that we all trust. But if we are working in pockets, the banks are here, microfinance are here, agents are here, telcos are there, it creates a disjointed system which does not help in creating the financial security that we need for this kind of digital infrastructure. So in economies where people are already ahead and already having that conversation and taking it forward is good, but we are still where in a situation where our regulator is hesitating to open this up, which in the end, at the end of the day, if you're moving forward, innovation like we are saying earlier on, technology development is not going to wait for them to, to think and get the best solution because there will be mistakes. You should learn from others who are already ahead and see how you can then fit it to the context of your country because you cannot copy and paste because each country and each economy and the cultures are different. But I believe that for us to, um, to promote and support this kind of financial infrastructure that we need is to link the platforms because when we link the platforms and have that interoperability, it would give build that trust that we need to actually push the digital payments or the digital services to the level that we want to to take it? Sure. Uh, all, I think all very valid points. And uh, I'll come back possibly now to uh, the theme of what we were trying to discuss, which was on preserving financial stability. I think it's an important, uh, it's an important topic. And uh, possibly to all three of you, I think it's an important question that we need to address. And it's not unique in the Indian context. I think it's applicable pretty much across countries that we've seen. Is uh, Somewhere I think there is, this, uh, there is this very expedient push by governments to build national payment systems. Uh, it's obviously a matter which has got differential attention both sides of the fence. Uh, the interesting case in point in India is that if you look at our ATM switch to you look at our fast ACH switch, which is UPI, IMPS on that build, if you look at our common mobility specifications and if you look at our gyro payment systems, which is the bill payment systems, all of them are entrusted to an umbrella retail organization promoted by the regulator, supported by the government. Uh, it's not unique as a case in point in India, but two things, right? One is that it creates this whole systemic risk to an ecosystem when you are at a 5% inflection point on digital to say, what if my systems were to go down, you have a concentration risk built there in entrusting a single not-for-profit umbrella retail organization to manage these. Secondly, I think it has a hugely chilling effect on competition, choice, innovation, and therefore pricing and how you price for these financial services. Uh, across the panel, uh, would you have thoughts on what should be the treatment of these national payment systems that governments across the world are creating? And since we are sitting in Delhi, what's the suggestion and how we should manifest these? Because also you might have seen 
Recently, the Subhash Kar Committee came out with proposals on the amendment to the Payment System Settlement Act. So I think there is a case in point to be made to push for, uh, 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 push for putting a middle ground into a regulatory role and a competitive role. But what do you think those measures should be to be able to accelerate the digitization of the ecosystem in India? Uh, Rohan, in this one, you should definitely put in your views. <laughs> I, I will. I, 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 okay. I'll ask you this question. <laughs> I will ask you. Uh, at least from a, from a country-specific standpoint, uh, two things. I think uh, very rightly uh, pointed out that having a single umbrella organization, I think there's a tremendous uh, concentration of risk. Uh, there is... Uh, so, so, obviously, from, from that perspective and... and, and 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 I guess we can we can manage it probably because only about five percent of uh, the entire retail transactions is digital. That's probably the reason we can just manage right now with a sing single uh, umbrella organization. But if this number starts to increase, I don't think so. In this country, we we'll, we can afford to have a single concentration where every possible you know payment transaction goes through one single single uh, single. Uh, Entity. So I would completely uh, agree to you that one singular en entity is not helpful. However, I would, you know, as an entrepreneur practitioner, new to, you know, we were kind of new to this space, uh, regulated space in India. I think coming together of one organization also helped in scaling of a few few products which were probably not present uh, three years, five years, years down. You know, for instance, uh, you know. It, it is kind of surprising that you know uh, that India didn't have something like an IMPS for for so many years, and uh, and I guess you know uh, products like IMPS, UPI, and a few others, which are definitely very unique to India. I think those start those definitely did get you know the progress of some of those products. This did probably fasten because of one singular organization because you know just the decision making and rolling out of the product was easy and therefore a certain amount of adoption that has happened around those products uh, has taken place to whatever extent. So I think uh, there are benefits benefits to having a singular organization at this point in time, but but uh, completely understand that uh, uh, that once the uh, the uh, uh, the digital penetration is far bigger, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. One thing that I would definitely want to point out is that is that the, the policy makers have to be very clear that they should not get into the business of doing business. I guess once the policy makers or the regulators start to get into the business of doing business, I think that's when it starts to get really, really difficult. And uh, that's when, in, when it, uh, you know, it's fairly gray, you know, who's competition, who's the regulator, who's the switch and all of that. And uh, I think that for sure, I think uh, we are just starting off and I don't think so we should make, as, an, or as a country, I don't think so we should make some of those very, very fundamental principal mistakes. We shouldn't be doing those. Mm -hmm. If I may just add, even though it... Oh, sorry. Even though I don't have much knowledge of the Indian, um, the India situation, but let me use the Cameroon example. Um, I will talk about two folds. You have the central bank that decided to come into um, the card space, the, the ATM card space, saying that I'm going to be the switch so that you can link all the cards for the 54 banks in the Central Africa um, space to be interconnected. And they wanted us to pay a fee for that, for that maintenance and they wanted to have specific conditions. Now, the central bank is at the same time our regulator and at the same time wants to do business, <laughs> you know? So it doesn't work. <laughs> Obviously, they have put a lot of money in this project, but it cannot work because um, they, they're not in the business of ATM cards. They don't know how to manage it. They don't have the marketing behind it, and they want the banks to market the, their cards for them, and they want to tell you or impose what will be the fee-sharing scheme in there. So of course it's not going to work. Um, so we are encouraging them that you, know, you guys need to step out of this and remain a regulator. Stand at the side, let us do this business. You have MasterCard, you have Visa, you have China Pay, you have people that can partner with us. You don't need to be in this dance. 
The second thing is that the government now wants to stem corruption by saying that for all um, payment areas, be it custom duty, be it um, taxes, people should pay electronically because this would help to have traceability. This will help to keep track of how much money is being paid into, this, into the government's treasury and would improve. But the point is that if they are not able to develop the right laws in terms of how we should do digital payments for the businesses, for the banks, how are they going to implement this for themselves as the government to do cash collection? So they have gone from calling bids from international players to come and say who can set up a platform for the government to collect at the different areas. They have sent it out to the banks to say you guys bid for which bank will be the collecting bank for tax payments or post um, custom payments or the rest and they're dancing back and forth. But I would say that it is necessary for us to get to a point where we can, the, the government can collect electronically because there'll be more efficiency, there'll be less corruption, and there'll be more funds in the coffers. But they have to address the basics, which is that how are we going to do it as a government, and how are we going to work with the private sector to do it, because they cannot regulate and at the same time do the business, just like what uh, my colleague here was saying. Sure, no, I think uh, those are very valid points. I'll give you a very interesting example. In India, I think in 2012 or something, uh, Mr. Nilikani was cha chairing a committee which was on uh, DBT. And one of the figures I still remember very distinctly was it cost the Indian government 3.64 rupees to transfer one rupee of subsidy. That's the inefficiency in the system. So anything upwards, any delta is very welcome. Uh, having said that, I think. Uh, Two things, and since you said I should provide my comments on that, I will. And I think uh, the important point is, as long as principles on, and this is something that uh, Finance Ministry Committee in India said in 2016, uh, chaired by a former finance secretary called Ratan Wattal, were three principles, and I think they're very simple principles which still work, which is, in order to ensure the prosperity of your financial systems, if you look at infrastructure, technology, and ownership neutrality, I think those are good principles to start off from. And I, I hope that would be the direction that the government of India will take. Governments in the UK are increasingly moving towards things like PSD2, et cetera, which are open plug and play frameworks. I know you have a question. I'll open up 10 minutes towards the end. Uh, and I think those are important uh, systems to be able to look at in how you can revitalize your ecosystem. But I'll come to the last point uh, in the evening because I do, I'm conscious I wanted to open it up for about 10 minutes to the audience for questions. Uh, and you mentioned it, uh, I wanted to keep it till the end, and since the topic was around uh, preserving financial stability, uh, data localization. Uh, hot topic, uh, I think the deadline's day after, right? As an impacted party, I'm conscious of that. Uh, but uh, just your thoughts on you know, what do you think, and please feel free to whoever would, would like to respond. What do you think are the pluses, the minuses, uh, the goods, the not so goods, of why data localization should or should not, in fact, be affected because we've seen a lot of media narrative in India now for about six months odd. I'm sure you're conscious of that. But just your viewpoints on how and where you see this moving, and uh, then I'll open it up for questions to the audience. Data localization doesn't affect Echo at this point in time because you're an Indian company. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, honestly, uh, ec you know, Echo's perspective, my perspective to doc lo do data localization, I think, you know, I think the rules go slightly weird when it says that for no purpose you can take the data outside. Uh, I think, uh, you know, in this, in, this, uh, in this age of cloud <laughs> and stuff like that, nothing's really... Uh, you know, so I think I think there's nothing which is exactly. So so I think I think as far as saying that that payments data and and this has been by the way we started this while there is a lot of news around data localization right now when we started in 2007 because we were working very closely with the banks we were never allowed to take data outside the country and therefore at least uh, you know it was that rule at least 
was there since since long for us and uh, so my take is i think in this age having a copy of the data within india i think that i think i think i think they are fair with that but uh, saying that you cannot take out the data for any purpose you know whether and then there could be multiple reasons for that and i think that's where the rule starts to not understand where technology is where it is at this point in time and it does not uh, 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 you know understand the importance of things that can be leveraged by taking data outside as well and uh, i think that's where the regulators are getting, i think the rules are getting slightly difficult if i may say so but uh, otherwise i think uh, you know uh, with the kind of uh, you know, i think the the kind of um, uh political environment and uh, you know uh, the kind of neighbors that that we have i guess you know i don't think so the government also has a choice of not asking for data to be here i think i think they are fair in asking that you know at least one copy should be there i think they go wrong when they say nothing can go outside that would be my view had um I feel like I was, we were talking before the session um, that in Cameroon where we are still collecting data or in Central Africa where we are still at the point of trying to identify people and places for our government to be talking about data localization. To me, it's just, <laughs> it's silly. Let's get data first, then we can localize it. But I think on the whole, I think we are already late. There's a lot of data out there Data from Cameroon is in France, it's in the UK, because people have already put out data. Social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, Gmail, and the rest already has people's data out there. Because some of those sites collect a lot of data, your date of birth, your age, your gender, your so a lot of data is already out there. Maybe because of all of this data protection and all what happened with Facebook and WhatsApp, people are trying to recall their data, but I think they are a bit late. So I believe that, yes, we should define properly the limits of um, who can use data, who can access it, what will it be used for, how will it be transferred. But to say we are going to localize it goes against globalization, it goes against innovation, it goes against the te technological um, progress that is already in motion. So I think it's just a failed fight. What we should be looking at is what we were discussing earlier today is to have structures, have a, a system or a community where we can all sit down and say, how are we going to manage our data? How are we going to share? If we have to share between um, India and the UK or Cameroon and the US, how is it going to be done? If it is for health reasons, how will it be done? If it's for security reasons, if it's for banking, because if you think about it, you use your credit card in India, in France, in Japan, and the rest, that is data. It's showing your trends, it's showing your expenditure, it shows your income, because sometimes to have a credit card, you have to say at least a range of how much you earn and what you're doing. So we already have data all over the place. So we cannot recall it, but I believe that we can put a structure around the usage, the transmission, um, and, and what is, what, what people, how people can access it, you know, and who has that access. Uh, sorry, Manta. Yeah. Uh, but also recognizing that these are also uh, early years in this kind of process and countries are trying to grapple with it. So they need some very sound policy and some very sound practical advice on what can work and what cannot work and how data protection should not be confused with data localization. Because like you said, and in an, in an um, earlier this thing, I mean, uh, there was a comment made that whatever you write on Facebook is, is open data, right? Yeah. Whatever you're sharing. So there's only so much you can localize. And what do you want to localize? Is it just the payment part of it? Or? So these are interesting debates. Uh, no, I New think, words uh, that come in every now and then. Actually, so I think uh, that's, that's useful. No, but uh, here's two cents that I have on this is, right? It's a, it's a funny situation because uh, I think the debates kind of come to saying that it's access versus storage, yeah. right? And uh, to my mind, the latter, does make sense till the time you have a solid reason on why storage is important. Secondly, the data you're looking for, and this is, to me, working with MasterCard and wearing my MasterCard hat now as a regulated entity in India, 
the data that you're looking for already exists in India. So what is it incrementally that you're looking for which feeds or fuels into the need of localization? And the third point, uh, I think philosophically and culturally a little bit different is the example of China and Russia is quoted all the time to say that this is the way that economy is moving there. So firstly, I mean directionally, if that's the way you want to move, uh, that's another debate. But uh, both China and Russia on the record do not enforce data localization. They have cross-border norms which allow for transfer of cross-border data. I think that's an important point. But without getting into that, uh, we have two days to see what the outcomes will be. Uh, hopefully, the government and the RBI will reconcile to what is most helpful in our journey without stifling the fintechs and the huge sunrise sector that that's come to be. So we will come and see that. But thank you very much for all of your time on the panel and your inputs. And I'll open this up for any questions. Uh, not a question. Can I make a comment? Uh, yeah. Uh, the panel discussion was very interesting, and I particularly enjoyed the response from the fintech ecosystem uh, in res response to Rohan's uh, um, question about the right balance uh, of the regulation uh, in terms of running the operations of a system uh, and then not doing the business as such. So I'd like to give a perspective from the country I come from, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, where we have had some interesting challenges as well as some interesting perspectives. So uh, way back years ago, we introduced a payment and settlement systems law, which modernized and created the platform for digital uh, payments ecosystem to grow. Uh, but getting the right balance that would um, ensure that innovation is not stifled is, was very difficult to achieve which required the country to regularly upgrade the laws and the regulatory landscape from time to time. Uh, what we see in that arena uh, taking place is that from a governmental or a regulator controlled model, there has been a gradual transition to a public-private partnership uh, to the extent that the government holding of that public-private partnership that runs the back-end operations for payment and settlement systems, including check imaging truncation, the real-time gross settlements, plus everything else, is a, a majority owned by all the licensed banks and non-banking financial institutions. It's just a fraction owned by government. Of course, the challenging fact is there's continuous pressure as to when the government will let go of their share and really get back into the business of uh, regulation. However, what we have seen is that the fintech ecosystem and the regular uh, uh, you know, innovation that's taking place in that uh, area continue to rely on the guidance of the regulator. And the regulator has to play the role of ensuring financial sector st stability <coughs> in that ecosystem as more and more fintech apps come in. in the, just uh, until about a year ago, the fintech apps were not even allowed, but that public-private partnership lobbied the regulator to allow now up to nine of them to function effectively uh, and they are now connecting uh, the real-time settlement, they are, they are part of the real-time settlements and they are connected to a fintech sandbox app called the Just Pay that was launched a couple of weeks ago. So that's the perspective I'd like to uh, highlight. And finally, since you're on the subject of securing um, digital payments and preserving um, uh, or the norms on pres preserving financial stability, uh, I think an uh, important point that 
gets missed out in this kind of discussion is the security aspect, which was in a way brought out in the data localization debate you just had. So the cybersecurity norms uh, that needs to be adhered to again becomes a challenge as more fintech uh, operations come into the payment uh, settlements ecosystem. So what we have done again is to privatize that and to create a financial sector cert, the first in South Asia, uh, where all the particip all the licensed banks, or everybody who's part of the digital payment ecosystem are shareholders and they work under the umbrella of the National Cyber Security Agency of which I'm the current chairman. So that functions independently and the baseline security standards that have been established within that framework is the basis for the banking supervision done annually to ensure that the that entire system is kept clean and secure. Thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, hi. I just want to ask one, uh, you know, question to Rohan. So Rohan, uh, um, you know, given the disruption happening in the fintech sector, and especially after Mr. Amitabh Kant's statement that by 2030, uh, physical uh, cards would be, you know, uh, presence would be negligible. So just wanted to have your, uh, you know, you know, comments or your, uh, uh, on uh, uh, the disruption that is happening in the FinTech sector and how is uh, MasterCard as an organization embracing themselves regarding those, especially, you know, after the, uh, given the exponential rise in the UPI uh, uh, transactions, even the wallet uh, uh, holders are uh, pretty much uh, apprehensive of how things will be going in the long term. So just, Sure, thanks for putting me in the spot, but I'll answer. Uh, so coming from where Mr. Amitabh Khan made that statement some time back, et cetera, here's, here's the reality that doesn't go away, right? India still is a 820-odd million debit card base. Now, in the interest of accelerating inclusion, accelerating digitization, you need to understand that that's the fundamental that's been built around the baseline to be able to leverage from. and. For example, if you look at things like Bharat QR, right, which came out as an initiative of MasterCard, Visa, American Express, and PCI, that still uses a debit card as your underlying base. So I'd put a cross wager on saying that I don't think debit cards or credit cards will so easily move away because the point that I was making in the earlier panel is that I think trust is a very important exercise in this whole ecosystem. We have just started trusting our plastic. And if you tell me that very quickly we will move away to trusting Another equivalent, I'd like to see what that equivalent is. However, in the interest of uh, the financial sector, I think for all of us put together, competition, contrary to what you might read in media, et cetera, is still cash. And if that's the competition with 95% of cash still you know, pushing it itself into the economy, I think the fundamental of interoperability is something that will really play out because as a consumer, you and me don't care whether you use a MasterCard, you use a Visa, you use et cetera, anything, et cetera, right? So what we need to do in the interest of accelerating financial inclusion, inclusive growth, digitization, is to increasingly make solutions which are safe, secure, seamless, and convenient to consumers, and that, fortunately or unfortunately, will mean using your existing cards which are linked to your bank accounts till we see another model come in place which replaces that, which will need a certain certain runway to be able to build trust towards. So I think it's a valid observation. I don't think it's a reality that will happen to us anytime soon. Uh, we have time for exactly, I think, two, maybe one more question. I know the panel's closing, so. I, I saw your hand, so why don't you? Like, we look at the timeline, like, when demonetization happens next day, 
Canadian has like a front page thing. And then uh, two years later, it's ten million dollar valuation, and um, we want digital India, digital payments. Financial inclusion is great, but and when it comes to like data privacy, I also don't think anyone questions how much access the government's going to have access to our data, and we know how. Just, I, I can't comment too much on Paytm, but let me, let, since I'm, I'll take the benefit of the fact that you, you mentioned that you are not in the country. Before, before the demonetization happened, I think we should give credit to what Paytm pulled off in this country, despite demonetization. If you today go to a pawn shop, it has a QR code. And I am not from Paytm and my name is not Vijay. But, but, as, a, but as somebody who looks at digital payments in India, I think... That organization, kudos to them for, for what they've pulled off. You know, yeah, there could be links, but, uh, you know, there are umpteen number of examples of other organizations, other sectors, who've taken advantage of certain things that have happened in the policy side. And there have been, by the way, there have been enough uh, in the past. And therefore, I think just to link the success of an organization to one particular winner, I don't think it will be fair. I think they did a fa fairly nice job even before demonetization. For sure, demonetization has helped. I wouldn't question that, but uh, I think they did a fairly decent job even before that. I think people, be, I think they had uh, about 100 million downloads even before demonetization. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. See, the data protection, data security is a very, very alive issue. I mean, the Supreme Court is ruling on it. The statute is ruling on it makes us all nervous, but I mean, there's no clear answers and no clear wisdom that we can. I mean, I yeah, know. but you could, you know, rather than putting payments and Paytm on a spot, you know, you could also ask the question, and why does Uber needs access to my photos on my phone? But they do take access. And uh, therefore, I think as far as privacy is concerned, I think it has to, I mean, it is yeah, it, it goes trust. beyond just payments. I think, I think payments is a very important part of the data that as consumers, you know, you can tend to figure out what I'm what I'm spending, how much I'm earning. It is an important part, but I don't think so it's everything. Sorry, can and I intervene to say sure. we've run out of time.